This is Mount Beauty in northeastern Victoria. This idyllic setting nestled in the foothills below the snowfields here. You would have to think there couldn't be anywhere further than the conflicts of war-torn Middle East. Today we're talking to some sufferers of post-traumatic stress disorder. There are many bridges to cross in the journey that is PTSD. And we're finding out a bit more about it from two ex-service people and a Veterans Affairs advocate. I'm joined today by Tony Fraser, who's a service veteran, fourth generation Australian serviceman. Tony, welcome. Thanks for being with us. And also Wayne Taylor, who's also a service veteran and a veterans advocate these days. Um, firstly to you, Wayne, can you tell us how you got involved with advocacy and a little bit about your army background? Yeah, fabulous. Thanks, John. My journey started um, in 1981 when I enlisted in, in into the army. And uh, I spent 24 years in the army until I was discharged in 2005. Um, along the way, I got busted up a bit and had uh, a number of major surgeries to my, my knees. Uh, then got to a point where army decided that I was no longer of any use um, and medically discharged me. So I spent some 18 months then recovering from that surgery uh, and then thought I need to do something, I need to give back. I didn't um, hopefully like the way I was, I was medically discharged. It was a bit horrific and uh, so I thought, all right, I'll, I'll go down and um, I'll become an advocate down the, the Hume Veterans Information Centre in Wodonga. The, um, just to butt in there, sorry, Wayne, the, um, just the circumstances of busted up a bit, um, bit ambiguous. Uh, was it actually on duty or were you out with Fraze one night and uh, no, things I'll, came unstuck I'll, down at Elgin's or something? Like I'd like to think I was out with Tony and we, we had a good <laughs> night, but uh, no, no, uh, unfortunately it wasn't. I was, I was serving at 1st um, Armoured Regiment and I was doing a service on a leopard tank and uh, the driver of the, the tank, he was doing his part of the maintenance and he had disconnected the driver's hatch and when I stepped down from the turret I put my foot onto a, an area, the driver's hatch, that I thought was secure and unfortunately it wasn't and I come tumbling off and, and basically you know, blew my knee out and, and um, you know, sort of 12 years later after many surgeries it got to a point where it was untenable. Yeah, um, and and you spoke of being frustrated and a little bit um, disappointed in the, in the terms of your um, uh, discharge from the army. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a very hasty discharge, and even today, you know, I still think about it. I still have dreams, you know, where I'm back in uniform, saying, "Listen, I'm supposed to be here." So I, I know it did affect me, but. Um, you know, is it where trauma starts? Is it is it oh, the circumstances of the you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about today, I guess, is, is about post-traumatic stress disorder. But does trauma start, in your case, for instance, and I know it's different for a lot of people, does it start with the injury itself or does it start with the way you're treated? Yeah, no, definitely not the injury. I think it's the treatment. For me, it was the treatment that in my discharge and how I was discharged. Um, essentially, from the time I had my surgery, my last surgery, to my discharge was 12 months so um, it was very quick. I wasn't even given time to to recuperate and, and see how I was going. So um, you add on top of that the fact that I had a family. I had to, to support my family. Um, I hadn't been able to return to work, so I had a lot of pressure on how I was going to move forward. Uh, and I think that all builds to to that you know, traumatic experience. Yeah, indeed. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that journey from from that um, uh, you, you disengaging from the army and and life after that and leading into in uh, advocacy in just a, a moment's time um, phrase if I could come to you um, your fourth generation uh, serviceman as you mentioned before um, but your involvement um, in conflict I guess uh, uh, it goes back to the Gulf War in 1991, where you were with the Australian Navy. Yeah, 1991. Um, I was on HMAS Brisbane. Um, I was 19. Uh, there's a song in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder how that would go. <laughs> yeah, not too sure, but it uh, uh, could be a hit. Um, yeah, I was 19. I'd been in since 88. Um, um, 
I suppose I was um, young, I was enjoying uh, life at the, at the time, but yeah. What were the circumstances of, of your um, deployment in, in the Gulf War? We, um, initially we were, um, we went over there to, to uh, patrol the Gulf of Oman, um, but once we got to um, Muscat, I think it was, was the first port of call, um, the American Navy uh, picked us up and plus the Sydney um, to um, to go um, into um, uh, the Midway Carrier Group. So we picked up as a destroyer, sort of the front line of the Midway Carrier Group. There was two carriers. I can't remember the second carrier, but Midway was one of them. Um, so yeah, our um, our job was defence of, of the carrier. Well, a change of location now. Uh, we've moved to Annapurna Winery in beautiful Mount Beauty in northeastern Victoria. And um, we've ordered lunch, and, and uh, I'm speaking with Josh and Megan New, who I would describe as veteran survivors. Um, and we'll find out why in a minute. Uh, but in the interim, um, Josh, I wanted to start with, with, with this question, and that is, this is a most beautiful, picturesque part of the world. Um, and uh, understandably, many people who want to want to move here. What what brought you here? <laughs> oh, it was a very uh, interesting point in my life, and um, yeah, actually, I found the place by coming to kill myself. Um, yeah, I was I wasn't coping well, and and we lived uh, an hour away from here, and drove drove up the highway, uh, up a bush track to to get ready to take my life, and um, thankfully some uh, lovely people drove past and, and just smiled and waved and it was enough to make me realise I wasn't there alone and and maybe question my decisions and so I, 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 that's how I found it. I've been on that cusp of, of um, suicide and, and people going, oh, it's so selfish, it's so selfish of, of you to, to take your own life. But people in that, in that, in that moment... Um, they're feeling that it's selfish if they do, if they do stay around. Yes. They're feeling that the burden they they they're putting yeah. upon uh, their family, that the helpers. I mean, I'm I'm sure the psychologists I've been through are probably worse off <laughs> meeting me and, and and going through my my issues. Um, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, um, it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing. The thing that drove you to that point must have been absolutely monumental and fearful. Um, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> it was um, a combination of, of, of a few things, and and um, I hadn't actually asked for help at that point in time. It was it was just that I was becoming very destructive in, in my own self, and and it just led to that that day, and then. Thankfully, not long after that, uh, my wife gave me the ultimatum to get some help or she was going to have to leave. And, um, yeah, thankfully I listened. What was your first point at port of call um, in getting in seeking that help? The, f the first port of call was... Um, I, I, so it was the night after her birthday and, and she gave the ultimatum because she didn't feel safe anymore and I went into work. And uh, I think there was an app recently brought out uh, about se at, about self-assessing uh, yourself for uh, mental health struggles, and uh, I did I did the app, and um, yeah, it was like it was screaming at me, telling me to get some help. So I, I realised that uh, that I needed to go, and and I went into the boss's office and said, "Hey, boss, I, I need some help." And he said, uh, "What with?" And I said, um, "No, nah, I need some help." And he'd already he'd already picked up on it. He'd only known me for about five months, and. And uh, he'd already picked up on it and he could tell straight away what it needed to be done. And straight away, he got the medical team on board and I called Megan and said, I asked for help. She said, what for? And I said, I asked for help. And she went, <laughs> burst into tears and said, I'll be there shortly. And that's when the world turned around. Mm -hmm. This was a job you had post-army? No, still. Still army. Still, still, army, still yeah. in the army. So I, I, I just finished a, a very uh, hectic posting in Sydney um, where I did two full deployments overseas and then uh, <laughs> I was meant to be posted to recruit training uh, and um, in. in in Wagga, Kapuka, and um, my wife 
uh, strongly disagree with that because four years she hadn't seen me basically because I was pre-deployment training and, and deployed in promotional courses. So I, I, I got a respite posting down to uh, Orbi Wodonga. So I was down there and, and then, yeah, it's just I think when the work pace settled down and, and uh, it sort of slowly gave me time to... The mind unravelled. Yeah. You were a stoker. Yeah. Um, and for the uninitiated, what does a stoker do? It sounds to me as, as though it's below decks. Yeah. And um, in the old days, I guess, shoveling coal, but that would have changed. Yeah, that, I suppose uh, that's where it come from. Uh, the ship I was on was a uh, steam, the last of the steam-driven ship. So it was uh, heavily manned around the, um, the engineering department. There was over 100 um, engineers. Um, I was a, a maintainer operator. Um, I was in the engine room, one engine, um, throughout that duration. We did uh, six months work up first, um, and then six months over in the Gulf, so, and that time was uh, in, in the engine room, yeah. And, and for you, um, that six months in the Gulf, that seems an incredible amount of time to me, to be in that sort of zone. How, how, how did you cope with that on a daily basis? How did you feel personally about being there? I, I think it was just a... Like, I'd already been, I think, close to a year um, at sea uh, or a year serving on, on the Brisbane before we went over there. And then we did six months work up. So it was just, a, it just become a normality. So the six months over there, we just woke up, we went to work, did our exercises or whatever we had to do, went and got a couple of hours sleep and then it was just, yeah, just kept on going day in, day out. When did you decide to leave the Navy and why? Um, it was in 96, not 86 when I said before, 96, I, I wanted a family, so, and I felt Navy life wasn't, um, wasn't a place to have a family, uh, I enjoyed my eight years, I love my eight years uh, of being in the Navy, um, uh, but I just felt it wasn't, um, a family environment for me, um, I suppose my background, um, had a bit, a bit of an influence, so yeah, 86, I met a, a lovely lady, um, uh, and uh, yeah, got out. The, um, I, I know that w when we've spoken before, you you go to a lot of reunions um, of um, y your colleagues in, in the services, um, and, and you know, you, you kept, try and catch up with each other, and you, uh, you it seems you communicate for, for, for that long ago, you you community, you know, you keep in touch with each other, and um, so you obviously that you had built some very, very strong relationships there. Oh, for sure, the, the relationships are, are very strong. However, a lot of us, and, and myself including, once I got out, we just disconnect. I, I didn't catch up with mates for ten years later. All oh, right, uh, and it was a push by a couple of our really good mates uh, that knew that I was struggling um, and just needed, uh, I suppose wanted to help and wanted to still stay in, in contact and they kept on hassling me out for years until once I went I better go. Let, let's go to the roots of that struggle. Um, when, when did you, when were you diagnosed with PTSD uh, or when did you feel that you needed to actually go and see someone? I, I think in the, um, I got out in 96, I think my first really meltdown was around about the 2002, 2004, um, but looking back, I, I think not long after I got back uh, from the Gulf, or even my, the second ship I joined was the Perth, um, looking back then, yeah, I was really struggling back then. So, but it come unstuck in the, two th in the early 2000s. When, when, when you say it come unstuck, um, can, can you give us a bit of, you know, without wanting to, um, to, 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 to go deep too, too deeply into it for you, but, but what, what, what does it, for, for us, for the lay people out there, what, what does that, for you, what, what's the definition of come unstuck? What's, what, what's, what are some of the symptoms of that? I, I think I was struggling with depression and, and anxiety. Um, and, and I suppose not um wanting to to uh deal with that um and and letting the emotions and and everything that depression is um the anger the distance the the outburst uh it just built up and built up and i wasn't um 
recognising or, or, or wanted to recognise that, that I did have an issue. It was everyone else's problem but myself. Um, the, the biggest thing was I didn't want to put it down to my wall, uh, my service, due to having an uh, uncle. An uncle did um, one tour, two tours of Vietnam. My uh, great two two grandfathers World War Two, great grandfathers World War One. I. I, I just felt that I, it was weak for me mm-hmm. to to, um, to 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 seem vulnerable. Yeah, and... yeah. But it got to a point where I, I just couldn't I, I couldn't deal with it anymore, and, and yeah, I lost some really close friends around it. Um, I, I nearly lost my marriage at that point in time. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have uh, split with 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 Tenya, um, but that's that's pretty sad. But um, yeah, just what depression is, they, they come out and they come out in full full flurry. You. Um I remember you saying to me in a conversation previously that, um, uh, and, and just going back to those reunions um, with your colleagues, that you had lost an inordinately high percentage of friends to who had completed suicide. Yeah, there's a few of them, which is sad. Um, in the early stages when we got back, we, we lost, a, I don't know the exact numbers, but we did, did lose a, a few in the first 10 years. Suicide and... Um, and uh, cancer, but suicide. There was a guy I joined up with actually. He oh, was within the first month we got back. He committed suicide, and I think there was a couple around that that, that stage as well. So yeah, that's pretty sad. That interesting thing of that the pause after the action, yep. after deployment, um, come home normal, normal in inverted commas life, mm. but then a, a period of time. Yeah, it was so. It, oh, it was really only a few months after my. When did I? I can't even remember. No, about five or six months after my last deployment, and then we posted down mm. to here. And I think just the change of pace. work pace. Yeah. Um, and I'd injured myself just before we posted down uh, to the region here. Um, I injured my hip, so my I couldn't use the token exercise to. Uh, prevent mental illness um, because my my hip had torn and so um, yeah I, I just slowly fell down into a dark hole and this just happened to be the place it happened. What did that feel like that what, what did it, can can you tell me what that looked like that dark hole? Anger. Anger. Guilt. <laughs> Frustration. Um, wanting to wish you could have done more and changed the, the decisions you have to make and um, I suppose to start off with I didn't know what it was actually going on but I just knew that I was angry I was angry at everything angry at life angry at everyone around me um, the only thing I wasn't angry at was alcohol you don't have to talk about it um, now if you don't want to but I remember two things one was the locked door yeah and two you said to me we were trained that we were going to go away and die. Well, that's a philosophy. As I say, I, I don't. If you don't want to go there, yeah, that's fine. Well, that's. I mean, that's the psyche of a sailor. You know, if you look at the, the wars gone by, we've we involved with um, with warships. You know, combat to combat, we don't have a good survival rate. And, and then that's the psyche that you, you, you psych yourself up to. If you're going into war as a sailor, there's a good chance that you're not going to come out, especially, uh, you know, a stoker below decks. I, I know the um, the upper decks guys would probably argue that as well. But, yes, yeah, but, um, sure. but, but yeah, the psyche is you're, you're going to die, you know. And, and I accept it. Um, I accept. I, I, we, we were asked before we left if you wanted to go or you didn't want to go and and I'll put my hand up and say yeah I accepted that and I accepted um, I accept that uh, there I was going to be a changed person when I came back uh, but what I didn't um, expect is is the um, the government um, not giving us that the support that I thought I would have got Hmm. and pushing me through some things. Uh, yeah. I would have thought the um, 
Can you talk about the locked door thing? Oh, um, that's one of my stresses. Uh, yeah, one of the things were uh, when we did go to uh, action stations for the for the um, for the first time. Um, we were talking conversation around. We had a had the deputy engineer down with us in one engine, so I was on watch at the time. And then there was talk around. Yeah, uh, if, if the doors will be locked if if it come if it got to that. Um, and there was rattling and that going upstairs and then, and I said is that the doors getting locked or the hatches getting locked and uh, yeah probably and and yeah that that that's when it's when it's sort of hit you yeah for real if 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 it, if we do get a strike well um, and if it's in that vicinity of that engine room or fire rooms um, there's a good chance I won't get out. What was the change in the man that you saw? Um. I think, uh, geez, I don't know, <laughs> deployment-wise, he was so focused and I could see, you know, um, what he was doing and why he was doing it. And then when he came home, um, we got this little booklet from Defence and it said, um, uh, what to look out for when your veteran returns. And I'm like, yeah, cool, no worries. <laughs> so I read this little booklet and, you know, immediately after he returned, there was little little things like he'd yell at the TV um, if there was a, a news story on that he disagreed with, he'd yell at it and and I'd be like, oh, let's just turn it off, you know, it's okay. Um, or we'd go for a drive and he'd be locking the doors in the car um, and he'd be scoping and looking and we'd go into supermarkets and he'd be suspecting that someone had a, a explosive backpack or something and he was just very hypervigilant. Um, you know, uh, then when we settled in, in the region, um, there was things like, uh, someone had knock on the door and he'd jump 10 foot in the air. Um, just very agitated all the time. And yet when he was at work, he was an exemplary soldier. He, he was the most, um, experienced soldier in that area and he was working so hard and was getting all the ticks in the box but then he'd come home and crumble and you know he'd walk in the door and I would avoid all con eye contact because it was I was worried what was going to happen if he was going to explode for some unknown reason yeah so he was losing he was leaving the best person that he was at work yeah and then walking in the door. Yeah, yep. And then I, I was dealing with the, the crumble. And the kids. And the kids, yeah. There wouldn't be a day that goes by where we see different levels of people suffering from post-traumatic stress. We see people that physically need a babysitter to bring them in. And I hate to say that, but they're quivering. They've got their hand, their head in their, their um, hands. Uh, that they're shaking, they need someone to physically guide them through. We have other people at the other end of the spectrum where it's just full on anger. Uh, so there wouldn't be a day that we wouldn't see someone suffering some sort of mental health and post-traumatic stress. That's extraordinary. Um, <coughs> that, that level of um, emotion, fear and, and a, a anxiety, um, it, do, how many years does that go back? I mean, in Fraser's, uh, t Tony Fraser's case, 20, 28 years we're talking about, yeah. uh, and and I guess for you, um, someone who was recently um, in service. I think it depends on the individual. It really does in their circumstances. We see people that'll function reasonably well through their life, and then there'll be a change in their circumstances. Maybe that they're winding down in their work. Yeah, something or, sets off. A, there's a trigger. Exactly, and it may be you know. 20 years, 30 years down the track that that post-traumatic stress. I, recently I had a, a lady um, and she served in Cambodia and it's only recently that the post-traumatic stress is, is starting to cut in. So it's dependent upon the individual and the circumstances and I, I guess how active their mind is. You mentioned earlier that you know, one of the things that immediately happened was you kind of like were catapulted into this world mm -hmm. um, of... of this horror world mm. and um and and what do you do you know what's the you lose your identity and you yeah. you, be, you become the person that's uh the, a carer yeah all of a sudden oh yeah an, an enormous carer mm -hmm. not only for your kids but for someone who's completely changed and morphed into something else yeah yeah absolutely um the 
I think that the day I realised was the day Josh asked for help. And I remember saying to myself, my soldier came home broken. He's broken. And he was really broken. And um, (laughs) to the point where he could no longer... Uh, be joy- in a conversation, you know, I'd say something to him in the lounge room and he would just stare at me with this look and I'm like, are you there? But he wasn't there. And so I'd try and joke a little bit and go, I'm looking for the loading wheel on his forehead, you know, on a, on a Mac or something. And uh, I'm like, are you just loading or what? And he's like, sorry, I what? And yeah. he, he couldn't even be in the conversation. Um, there was, uh, I had to take over the finances. I'd had to. Um, so I managed all the finances prior. Yeah, he finances. was all over the finances prior to, you know, to becoming unwell. And uh, so, yeah, I had to take over all of that. Um, on the kids' front, I was still doing that anyway. I was a stay at home mum at the time, which was great. Um, so I was able to look after him in that capacity. Even things down to, he could no longer make a phone call. He could no longer reply to an email. Um, he couldn't drive for two and a half years. Um, so I had to literally do everything for him. Um, remind him to shower. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> have you showered this week? Um, <laughs> um, just even you, just things like that. You, was you, you, you've clearly done a remarkable, <laughs> ma- remarkable job. When he we showered sh- today. <laughs> we, <laughs> When we see the man who's sitting here today. Look, our lunch has arrived and um, looks absolutely superb from the kitchens of uh, Annapurna Winery. So uh, we'll take a short break and be back with more Town Crier. (laughs) It's one of those sort of jobs or, or, or positions where general society takes for granted and don't really think about. I used to want to be in the Air Force and then I realised you might have to go to war and I was like, no, <laughs> not for me. Oh, I can imagine definitely coming back from over there. Absolutely, yeah, PTSD would be a big thing, yeah. They treat them like all parts, eh? You know, disabilities, that sort of stuff, that disregard me to nothing. But we're here, who fought for the country? That's how it is. There's been, like, some studies done in America by an organisation called MAPS and what they're doing is they're finding out that Small microdoses of MDMA can actually treat PTSD and actually cure it in some circumstances. I can't help but worry about what walls have been built in their mind, the rigid mentalities that they've, they've, uh, you know, been instilled in them that they just believe so wholeheartedly because they want to believe in what they're doing. They want to believe that they're fighting for honour and for Australia. But what if it's wrong? What if? What if the motive is wrong? You know, how do you how do you tear away someone's uh, purpose and say you've been fighting the wrong fight? Why are you shooting that bloke there? You're not even going to come and get, get take us over. Groups like Soldier On, where, where there's those networks and those, those sort of you know, peer group support um, programs, I think they're, they're important just to uh, is it you know, a problem shared, is a problem halved. I've treated people with. Well, one woman in particular with PTSD, and she'd been sexually assaulted working in the mines and couldn't sit beside a man or be near a man at all. And the first part of the thing was really just getting her to feel the feelings that were coming, which she said had never been, that idea had never been put to her before. So in doing that, she found after a short period of time that the intensity of those feelings had dropped. And then the next day, she was actually able to come up and give me a hug, which she said, you know, before she wouldn't, even the idea of that would have sent her, um, you know, into a sort of spin. There's a quote from Lao Tzu, which is a very useful one. And it, it goes like, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the moment. And it's the projection of fear into the future and the past that causes all of the issues. Gee whiz, um, Johnny doing some great work on Streetwalker there and some interesting opinions. We've had lunch here at uh, Annapurna, which was uh, just delightful. And um, I'm back with Josh and Megan, uh, veteran survivors. (laughs) Uh, We're talking about PTSD 
thanks again for your honesty and you know your generous Thank you. um, contribution you're making. You said something to the effect of anxiety you can kind of manage in, in, in ways, but it's the depression that you couldn't yeah. make any inroads into. And, and, that, and that still to this day is, is the challenging thing. Um, so the PTSD, which is predominantly an anxiety-based uh, disorder, it's, it's one of those things where you need to learn the skills to then be able to identify, say, the triggers and then being able to work through them through graded exposure or um, just becoming aware how the, that actual illness affects you. Um, and then with the depression side of things, when you know, the, you know, a lot of a lot of people say fitness, fitness. Well, you know, I was I was f- a very fit soldier. Um, yes. I fortunately injured my leg, um, so there was a lot of fitness between my shoulder and my and my hip that I couldn't do. Um, but you know, trying to find the right medications, and I went through multiple multiple medications and and multiple different treatments. But uh, for me. The biggest treatment that worked was um, electroconvulsive therapy, which is shock treatment. Okay, that sounds horrifying to me. <laughs> um, take, can you take us through what goes on there, please? Yeah, it, it's a in massive. Yeah, it's yeah. a massive. <laughs> it's a massive. You're talking to me, remember? <laughs> it's a massive misconception. Um, you know, everyone everyone sees a movie and believes everything what the movie yeah, is, but yeah. it's it's um it's it's nothing like that. Thankfully, the team that I had down at uh, Austin Hospital down in Melbourne. Um, knew what they needed to do which we would expect but but they made it feel comfortable and you know the first few times it was a bit nerve-wracking and and some of the the pain that you got from it um but basically you you get taken into hospital you you have um a general anesthetic that's not too heavy so it's only a small amount to put you under um and then they just induce a epileptic seizure epileptic fit uh, which basically sets makes the brain reset itself and and start producing chemicals and then you wake up about 10 minutes later um, and you're a bit dose, dozy and, and, and you come to and you're a bit tired for a day or so, but uh, um, that seems to work. Mm. So, How many of those treatments did you have? <clears throat> a Over 100. Um, oh, man. <laughs> I, so I, I started uh, that treatment back in 2015. Um, it took a lot of my memory away because of the, the, the type of treatment and the frequency that I had. Um, but what we found that was that the treatment actually improved my baseline of depression mm-hmm. that I could actually manage and, and function. Yeah. Um, so we we liaised with them and we organised maintenance ECT and we started fortnightly, uh, out to monthly, and, and we just we worked with how my progression was because the better I was sort of feeling, the more I'd try and push myself to to uh, work on the PTSD side, to work on the triggers to you know, to be able to be back and, and be able to go watch my son at Little Athletics and not scream profanities and, and drop to the deck when the cap gun goes off. Um, mm. um, yeah, the uh, initially when when the psychiatrists uh, mentioned ECT, we were very, you know, weary, of course, and um, we did a bit of research and tried to find out what we could. And at that point in time, there was nothing. There was nothing that we could find out about it. There was no long-term studies done on what might happen down the track. And so we we sort of weighed up the ideas and went, okay, well, if it gives Josh a better quality of life now while he's young, while his children are young, let's worry about the future later. Let's Let's just do what we can right now. And so we really found that during his hospital stays, he would have 12 treatments in a four-week period. So three days a week, he would go in and have ECT whilst in hospital. Um, And even I would start to notice that there was an improvement and that was just on the phone because I couldn't be in Melbourne Mm. all the time. Mm. Um, And then when he would come out of hospital, he'd be good for about a month and he would get up in the morning and he would do things and, and you could see he was feeling a bit better. And then about a month later, it, um, it was kind of like the storm came back and the dark clouds would just yeah. just smother him and, and he could no longer function. Um, he would stay in bed all day, couldn't get out of bed and I'd then be on back on the phone to the hospital, can I get Josh in please because I can't keep doing this. Um, it was literally like living with someone that had 
I don't know, just being completely possessed. You, there, there's nothing you could do. No matter what I said, no matter what I suggested, I couldn't fix him. But the ECT was the only thing that kept him up and about. So, yes, we uh, he had a lot of treatment in hospital. And then after his hospital stays, he said, I don't want to be in hospital anymore, but can I continue this treatment? And they said yes. So we continued doing that. It's worked up until... Two months September, ago. September. Yeah, he had his last one two months ago. Right. How are you going now? Uh, this is the longest I've been without it since 2016. So it's... Um, Golly, that's four years. Yeah, it's it's been a long time. And uh, there was close call last, uh, last week, two weeks ago. I had a, a, a serious trigger and, and my head went downhill pretty quick. Plus Remembrance Day. Plus Remembrance Day. Yes. But I, I made it through it and... Yeah. I guess for those who, um, Wayne, who, who don't get an outcome from DVA, who who are in limbo land, um, there must be there must be scads of those people. I th- ultimately, each claim will be determined, whether it's su- successful or not. But each claim will be determined. In that interim period, there is a period of time where people do feel in limbo. Tony felt that way with his appeal. He felt in limbo that it's not being settled. The reality is, though, that DVA are dealing with thousands of claims every day. Mm. Um, And, in in fact, I actually do feel for the people at DVA. They do a wonderful job. I know there's a lot of criticism of DVA, but they're being directed by government. And, unfortunately, we have very short terms in government, so government yes. can't have very good, strong policies because they're too worried about the next election coming up. I know of a guy I met in a in a in a in a park um, uh, about a year ago, and I've seen him quite often since. He's a veteran, and um, he he wanders Australia um, with his swag, and and uh, you know uh, when the weather's right, he camps in 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 our beautiful northeastern Victoria. Um, but I, and I've seen him a few times, and uh, I often wonder, you know, how many, how many of of, of the people are in that gentleman's circumstances. Um, I'm not saying that it's. <laughs> I, I couldn't ascertain whether it was a place he wanted to be in mm. or whether he didn't want to be in. He, it's just what he does. There's, there's no doubt. There's veterans out there who disconnect, and and they find the solitude. Um, is what they need Mm. and they will wander Uh, there's other veterans who unfortunately find themselves homeless um, through situations that uh, they weren't prepared for Um, numbers I I don't know but we do see them in the local area and we provide the support when we're notified Um, we provide that support where we can triggers come in all sorts of uh, different shapes you talked about the one where where, where you were camping um by by a river up here. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'd gone on a legacy camp and um, uh, we're all in the tent sleeping away and um, Josh woke me up and he was shaking. Um, I thought he was having convulsions or something. He was shaking so badly. And with talking about it and understanding, we he realised that it was cold and he could hear water and he could hear wild dogs barking in the background. All of that took him straight back to Afghanistan when he was on patrol. Um, yeah, when we stayed, stayed out when, when he had to be, yeah, outside of the, um, the compound. And so, yeah, we were able to kind of chat about it and calm him down a little bit and he was able to get a bit more sleep and, yeah, try and deal with it the next day. I think the big thing too, I loved for this for this to get out that um, for me when I did leave, I mean even when I got back from the Gulf, I posted off to Brisbane the day we got back from the Gulf, and there was no counselling, there was no um, um, deprogramming. Well, we talked about we were, we're programmed, but we're never deprogrammed. When I got out the Navy, there it, it was um, there was no I had no. Um, transition or, or um, counselling or any anything to transition into uh, civilian life and civilian life was bloody tough. We always find that we're at our worst when we don't communicate. Yeah. We Because your own thought patterns and your own automatic yeah. negative thoughts start creeping in, um, if you're not communicating to each other then 
that's to your own detriment. Some days it might be just done on a text message when you're sitting next to each other. Yeah. It's, um, it's, <laughs> Doesn't know, have to. You don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you've just got to find a way yeah. that you can express what you're feeling. Don't suffer in silence, guys, girls. Just, you know, reach out. Reach out to to these these centres and, and, um, and, and just accept that we, we need a hand. We need a hand. Is there anything that you could say to people, or you want to say to people that out there who, who, who might be the partner of someone who's suffering, or, or might be a sufferer themselves? I, when someone is suffering, both physically and mentally, the whole family suffers. Uh, it's not just the individual; the whole family suffers. Yeah, yeah I just add to that. I, I think um, one of the biggest stresses of my um, ex-partner was watching me suffer in silence. I think um, that that would have been uh, very hard for her. Um, definitely to come up in conversations. Um, so, yeah, not only um, not only my wife, my daughter, but but I see that quite often. We've got a, a colleague that we work with. Um, her husband is a veteran in Afghanistan, and and the struggles that she has, she's three kids, dealing with. Um, with uh, with him and and then the kids and the you know the I suppose that that effect that gets passed on it, it's bloody hard. This town is is an amazing little town that has provided so much support uh, to to not only me but my family and and those that are around us. It's it's mm. yeah we. <laughs> We, we, you know, we took the darkness of, of how I found this place and we turned it into the, to the brightness that we have and how we can in, involve ourselves back in the community yeah. through fundraising for the Men's Shed or for uh, Hume Veterans or the RSL and, and stuff like that. Any, any chance that I have to be able to help back, give back to the community is where I try to help out. You said to me the hardest thing is to keep going and, and Tony mentioned that earlier as well. For, for, for some, for all of us at times, mm -hmm. the hardest thing is to keep going. It is the hardest thing to keep going, especially when you're at the worst. And especially that's generally when you're trying to deal with all doing all the, all the paperwork and all the, all the, the challenging things. And, and you know, I, you've got to want to live for yourself first. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things that I, I had to realise within myself. I had to live for myself so that I could get better to then be there for the rest of my family. And I'm, I'm by no means better. You know, it, it only takes a simple trigger next week to send me back downhill, but you just got to never give up. Mm. And uh, thankfully having this beautiful, gorgeous... Uh, I may have aged her a little <laughs> bit, <specimen>. wife. <laughs> um, she may have aged 10 years being oh, with yeah. me, but um, she, if it wasn't for her, uh, and, and I, I wouldn't be here. I want to finally wrap up with a story that you told me this morning, uh, Tony. Um, and uh, is this a good one or? A <laughs> well, it ha it's about cricket. <laughs> uh, what camera am I on, John? It's about the cricket, um, ladies and gentlemen. And Tony, yes, they play uh, cricket, and uh, the, the opposition that were a few short, and had to bring in um, some young fellas. And uh, one of the under twelves came and batted, and uh, and Tony. Uh, <coughs> and, and, and I think this relates. Very nice to our conversation. Tony uh, unleashed a volley of short pitch deliveries at the young boy. <laughs> and, and it just goes to show that some of the anger that he carries is, is, is still there and surfaces at time to time, in this case on the cricket pitch. Um, <laughs> that poor kid's probably getting cancelling now. I feel bad. <laughs> I, 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 felt, I, I felt like a, a, a bit of a mongrel now then. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's even worse now. I know. It's difficult. Uh, Isn't it ridiculous when you get you, you bowl one and you don't want it to dig in and, and into the turf and then rear up from a good length? But you, <laughs> you, you know, you bowl the perfect delivery to the batsman. Yeah. I don't think he was any higher than my hip, hip so <laughs> poor little kid. He is. If you're out there, son, um, you're a very brave boy and keep up the good work. And we'll make sure you don't have to face the might and wrath of phrase yeah, again. yeah yeah sorry now you two thank you so much <laughs> wonderful thank you. people Happiness. generous people um and uh keep on keeping up the fight one day at a time mm -hmm. okay keep moving forward
Oh, and that Johnny Kovacs, our director producer, always puts together a beautiful gift um, for our participants. <laughs> so we've got to oh, I'm wit. participating. <laughs> I get a participation award. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the army didn't give you this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a thanks for coming medal. <laughs> <laughs> now. We've got. Oh, look at that! Now, John. John is a, 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 looks a, like a big gardener, nut. producer. Oh, look at that! Looks oh like goodness. a big nut. <laughs> Don't know what it is. You can draw faces on it though. <laughs> so there's. The, we've got Aww, that, thank you. and we've got um, banana. You know, fruit lemonades. He grows what? as well, or his family grows. A limonade. So it's beautiful weather for having those. Yes. And uh, what have we got? Look at these. Socks. Taco They're socks. Taco socks. <laughs> you get your tacos. Are they? And uh, no, no, that's tacos. a taco. Nani's. Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, oh, there might be something I here. Think there might be some other a little, little. There you go. Chilies. <laughs> Hot socks. Uh, isn't that beautiful? Thank you, John. Thank you. That. We've got the goodie bags for you both. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Now, Tony and Wayne. Now you can share these because there's, look, some socks with bananas <laughs> on <laughs> Banana socks, slippery bananas, and whatever this is. What is it? That's a melon. It's a melon? Yeah, it's a melon. They're really nice, those melons. Yes, I'll take you, yes. Uh, <laughs> we can share that for Smoko tomorrow. Real, real bananas. Real and banana? And I think, and, and some Anzac biscuits. Some Anzac biscuits. How appropriate. Yeah, right. So gentlemen, there you take, take her bags. Everyone gets a prize on this show. Uh, 